Hi, good evening. I'm Marty Polio, Superintendent of Jefferson County Public Schools. Thank you for joining us tonight uh, for our second virtual town hall meeting about what school will look like uh, when we are able to return to in-person school. If you recall, our first one was back in mid-July. And over the course of the past seven or eight months, we've been through a lot of together, a lot of difficult and challenging times, no doubt about it. Uh, but we are so excited with the prospect of seeing our children again in our schools, and we can't wait for that to happen. Throughout the fall, obviously, we saw rising numbers throughout our community. And the great thing now is we are starting to once again see that major decline in cases in our community, and that is so exciting for the prospects of returning to school. And once again, we can't wait to see our faculty, staff, and students, all the educators we got into this profession so that we could work on a daily basis with our students um, and see them face to face and the excitement of learning opportunities. And I can't wait to do that again. Uh, in the coming days, our educators are going to receive the second dose of the vaccine. It's amazing that here we are uh, in mid-February, we've already gone through the first dose of 13,000 employees. We are beginning the second dose starting tomorrow. And over the next three weeks, we will go through that same cycle of repeating and ensuring that all of our employees get that second dose, which once again, will bring us closer to returning uh, to in-person school. So we are excited about that opportunity and we're excited to answer your questions tonight and see so many people joining us uh, so that we can show you what in-person school will look like when we open our doors here in JCPS. We have worked so hard on these plans over the months. I wanna thank so many people who are working hard at the school level, at the district level to ensure safety. It's a challenging and difficult prospect. The larger the district, the more difficult it becomes, but we know we got this. We know we can implement uh, successfully and safely these plans. And there is no doubt safety comes first, but once again, we're so excited to be able to do this and look forward to opening our doors. I wanna say a few words of thanks before we begin. First of all, thanks to all of the educators in JCPS. And when I mean educators, that's everybody. Uh, teachers and classified staff and central office staff and bus drivers and maintenance workers, uh, clerical staff and on and on. I could keep going, um, but you have done so much during this difficult time to step up and work hard and meet the needs of our students. I know it's difficult teaching and supporting students in a virtual environment, uh, but I'm so thankful to stand beside you during this difficult time. And I say thank you for all your hard work. To our parents, we know this has been difficult and challenging. Once again, I'm a parent as well. Um, and we know this is an added burden. We appreciate your patience and grace with us as we move through this process and ensure safety of students and staff. But we appreciate all of our families so much for the hard work uh, that they have endured through this difficult time. And I know we all can't wait to get our students back, our children back in school. And finally, to our students, I know this has been difficult and challenging on you as well. Um, we appreciate your resilience and your hard work. I have seen so much great work taking place, whether that's backpack defenses, I've seen backpack defenses, projects, presentations, just innovative things that are happening in the classroom. I know you wanna be back in person too, and we can't wait to get you back there. Uh, and uh, definitely to finish out the year, um, our board will make that decision, but we wanna finish out the year and celebrate with you so that we can move on. We can support all of our students who need additional learning during the summer, and then obviously come back at the start of the year for a great 2021, 2022, um, and in, in the interim celebrating with our students in those graduation ceremonies. So we look forward to bringing you um, our plan tonight and all the hard work we've put to this plan uh, so that you can see everything that is in place and feel confident uh, that we have safety procedures in place to implement in-person school in a safe and healthy way. At this time to kick off our program, I'd like to turn it over uh, to our uh, to Renee Murphy, who will talk to us about uh, this evening. Renee. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Polio, and thank you everyone for being on. I just checked my phone and we have over 2,000 people who are on with us right now live as we begin to answer your questions about what school will look like when our buildings reopen and about our reopening plan. So we have several participants who are on with us virtually. You'll hear from our employees, from our parents, and we have some students. So we're excited to see students here with us this evening as well. And this is also a great opportunity because our text lines are open for you right now. We've reopened our text lines. We have a team of people standing by to answer your questions. We have two text lines that are available for you to use. We have our safety protocols text line, and you can text 502 
383-9894. If you have questions about the safety protocols for when our buildings reopen. If you have questions regarding the in-person or virtual learning experience, you can text this phone number, 502 502- 234-1460. Again, those are the numbers right there for safety protocols. You see the number to text. And for questions about what the in-person versus virtual learning experience will be like, you see the phone number right there for you to text as well. Uh, so we're very happy to be able to answer your questions here this evening. And we do want to let you know that we will be answering questions that were submitted to us during this broadcast this evening. Uh, so we are ready to hear from you. Uh, we're excited that you're participating. We really want this to be um, as interactive as possible in this virtual setting. So we look forward to hearing your questions. We look forward to uh, seeing those text messages come in and we thank our participants for being here with us this evening. All right, Dr. Polio is going to be kicking off our presentation this evening. We are also joined by several key members of our district leadership team. We have our chief operations officer, Chris Perkins, who'll be answering questions. Now, there's lots of questions about operations throughout this whole process. We also have our chief of schools, Robert Moore. Uh, he is one of our newest chiefs, so welcome Robert, and uh, thanks for being here tonight. Our chief academic officer, Dr. Carmen Coleman is with us as well to answer some questions about what the virtual learning experience will be like and can answer all questions academics. Our chief of exceptional child ed education who supports our students with special needs, Kim Chevalier is with us here this evening as well. Thank you, Kim. We are joined by Jimmy Adams, who is our Chief of Human Resources. Uh, so we know we have lots of employees who are with us this evening and watching. Uh, so Jimmy will be here to answer some of your questions. And our Manager of District Health, Dr. Eva Stone. She has been busy and she has been working tirelessly for months as we, as we, as we have been preparing for our potential reopening of schools. So Eva is here with us as well. Thank you very much for being here to all of our panelists. Dr. Polio, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, Renee. Uh, we appreciate uh, you setting this up for us and we appreciate all the people coming online to see um, our plans for return to school. And if you see everyone turn on their camera and see that not many of them have gotten much sleep over the past six months because they've been working hard to prepare for this. And there is no doubt they have built a comprehensive plan um, that follows state guidance. That's what we've been working on for state guidance. As I said before, the larger the district, uh, the more challenges come into play, and there is no doubt about that, as we are about the 27th largest district in America. But we know we are going to, to meet the needs of our students. We want to reiterate for families. Uh, first and foremost, you have the option, once we uh, is approved by our board, you have the option of in-person or to continue on with the virtual learning experience for the remainder of the school year. We want to support you in both ways and support our families and students in both ways but ensure that when we do have in-person school, uh, that we are following all the guidance from our state health department to ensure that we provide a safe uh, learning environment for all of our students. This past week, uh, on Tuesday, we presented to the board, I think you probably saw a 66 uh, PowerPoint slide. Many of them were just pictures of boxes, but we wanted to show that uh, how much PPE we have collected over the past several months so that we can once again build confidence in the fact that we are gonna meet the needs of our schools. We are gonna get everything our schools need. We have ensured our principals that they will have all the resources that they could possibly need to implement this plan. Our schools together right now are developing a committee where they can work together so that faculty can give feedback to each individual committee um, and work together to ensure that the communication is clear about um, all of the plans at each individual school level. The district gives guidance, provides resources, um, we will be there when, when it is needed at the school, any of these supplies or resources are needed, and then the schools work to fine tune their plan for each individual school. You can find those online, once again, um, at our website, each individual school's plan. We have over 4 million face masks right now available to students and staff, so we will have face masks and PPE available for every single student and every, at every single school and uh, our personnel for the remainder of the year. We have that in stock and ready to go. Um, and thankful for our work of our Chief Operations Officer, Chris Perkins, who's gonna talk to us more now about some of the other uh, personal protective equipment we have for students and families that are in-person school. Thank you, Dr. Polio. Uh, just to go over a, a few of the guidelines on personal protective equipment, the use of masks is required uh, of all students and staff unless they have a medical waiver on file at the school. 
Students and staff should only be lowering their mask while they are actively eating or drinking. Staff and students are encouraged to provide their own mask, but the district will have plenty on hand to provide them one if needed. We also have other additional um, PPE or personal protective equipment that will be provided to employees, including much more specialized materials uh, to support medical and health needs of students. Regarding cleaning and disinfecting the environment, our, our custodial staff uh, uses disinfectants approved by the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency. We've also purchased for each school battery powered sprayers that deliver the disinfectant uh, in a mist form to provide coverage in those harder to reach areas and those areas that, that require uh, much more frequent uh, cleaning and disinfecting those high contact areas. Uh, in addition to that, we've also in increased the cleaning and disinfecting regimen of our housekeeping services uh, for those high contact surfaces. Riding the bus. Uh, all students will be required to wear a mask again on the bus unless, unless they have a medical waiver. Uh, upon entering or boarding the bus, students will be uh, given hand sanitizer to use to clean their hands, or to disinfect their hands. Uh, Kentucky Department of Education also recommends that windows remain open uh, as weather permits to, to increase airflow uh, when it's safe and weather permitting again. Uh, students will be separated to the extent possible on the bus, but understand buses may operate at full capacity. Um, also, there will be designated seats at the front of the bus for those students who are exhibiting symptoms um, of being ill. We'll have additional staff on hands at the bus depots to help students with the social distancing while they're waiting to change buses. Drivers will also be cleaning buses in between runs and doing thorough cleaning and disinfecting each day uh, after the runs have been completed. Students will be assigned to seats on the buses and attendance will be kept uh, maintained for contact tracing purposes. At this time, I'll kick it over to uh, Robert Moore, our Chief of Schools. Thank you, Chris. Uh, when you look at our school plans, every school and every building will have uh, details on arrival and dismissal for our return to school. In every plan in every school upon arrival, Every student will be processed through temperature checks for screening and exclusion. Hand sanitizers will be available for all students and the staff. Temperature scans are not required before boarding the school bus for dismissal. Students who have been identified with a fever during the school day will not be transported home on a bus with other students. At this time, school teams are increasing space between seats removing non-essential furniture so we can satisfy all the social distancing requirements that uh, are uh, in our safe and healthy at school. Placing signs, markings, visual indicators on the floors, doors, walls, et cetera, all of our common areas are marked for social distancing. Reviewing and modifying processes to reduce the number of students in common areas. And if space will not allow students' desks to be six feet apart in classrooms, the school will space desk as far apart as possible. And I'll pass it on to Chief Kim Chevalier. Hey, Kim, I think you're on mute. If you can unmute. I am. Mind. Thank you. I was. Thanks, Robert. Um, our ECE staff will teach and model expectations using visual supports, social stories, verbal reminders, and picture boards. Our schools will have specialized PPE to support ECE staff who are in close contact with students, particularly those for toileting and other health, health supports. Our schools have been provided a plan for the safe handling and disinfecting of items such as wheelchairs, walkers, or devices that travel from home to school with our students. Our schools will ensure that any student with a disability will receive their appropriate accommodations. And our schools will identify critical job functions and positions at, at their school and plan for alternative coverage by cross-training staff. So all kids uh, will be able to be, uh, get their support no matter who's there. Our therapist and related service personnel will have access to specialized PPE equipment. And the ECE department has provided schools with recommendations of how to support students in all areas of our disabilities. And finally, district ECE re resource staff will continue to provide ongoing live support for our administrators, implementation coaches, and teachers throughout the year. Next up is our expert medical professional, Eva Stone. 
want to talk a little bit about the health room and isolation room. So there'll be a health room um, designated or isolation room when there's students who are ill that need that need separated from other kids. There'll be adequate health supplies and personal protective equipment available. Um, we'll have nurse practitioners available via telehealth visits for assessment of students if there's not somebody readily there. And we're working with our contracting agency to hire additional um, medical staff for the schools to, to help meet the needs of students and um, support contact tracing. Um, again, for, the, for contact tracing, we're working to bring on additional staff to help uh, fulfill this need. Schools will report a positive case of COVID to the health services team. So every school will have a healthy at school officer. That officer will report um, positive cases when they're notified to our team who will be working with the health department to contact those who may need to self-quarantine. For those who are identified as a close contact to a case, the length of time for self-quarantine for our students will be um, typically 14 days after the last exposure. People who are actually diagnosed with COVID-19 are usually out of school for 10 days beyond um, the start of their symptoms or positive test. Um, those dates can vary between people based on how someone is sick and sometimes some other circumstances. Your child can return to school when the local health department or the student's provider provides clearance documentation for the school record, but a negative COVID-19 test is not required for a student to return to school once those 10 days have passed. And I'll turn it over to Dr. Coleman. All right, hello. So we'll talk a little bit about virtual learning and what that will look like. So first of all, um, every JCPS school will offer both in-person classes as well as a virtual learning option. Um, through that option, um, virtual learning will be delivered by JCPS teachers. Um, Google Classroom will be used as the instructional learning platform. And um, just like with NTI, Google Meets or Microsoft Teams will be used for live instruction. Um, the virtual learning options are school-based. Um, it's also important to know that all services like Gifted and Talented, ECE, Advanced Placement, and ESL will be available. And students will also be able to participate in sports and extracurricular activities with their school, um, even if they do choose the virtual option. Back to Renee. All right, Dr. Coleman, thank you so much. And thank you to our great team. As Dr. Polio mentioned before, our team has been working nonstop for the better part of a year to get ready for our schools to reopen. It really has been a collaborative effort. Uh, Jimmy Adams has been working really hard too. He's our chief of HR. And I'm gonna pick on him for a second because he didn't have slides in the presentation. So uh, Jimmy, you're gonna be asked some of the first questions here. Um, so I have a couple of questions that have already come into our text line and questions we've received earlier. One of the questions is, I live with a family member who is considered at higher risk according to the CDC. I am concerned that if I return to work, I could potentially expose that person to COVID-19. Do I qualify for Americans with Disabilities Act's accommodations? <clears throat> well, thank you for that, Renee. Um, one of the things that people need to realize is the ADA requirements are clear that the qualification for an accommodation is for the employee's disability, not a person with whom the employer resides or for whom the employee may be the caretaker. So this situation would not qualify for an ADA accommodation. However, the board has asked that we establish a special consideration uh, for permission to telecommute list for individuals in this or similar situations. And once we've completed the review of the ADA and the Kentucky Pregnant Workers Act request, we will review the special considerations list. Um, while we hope to meet all requests of this nature, we have to balance uh, that, that those accommodations with ensuring that school has enough staff to safely open in-person classes. So another question that have come in from our employees, Jimmy, um, if I must quarantine due to a uh, potential exposure, if I have to quarantine for any other reason, uh, will I be able, will I have to use my sick days? Well, the good news is that if you've received the vaccination, uh, then according to the most recent guidelines, you will not have to quarantine. Um, However, if you're forced to quarantine, as long as the current executive order from the governor is in place, then employees may use the COVID-19 emergency days. 
Um, employees can have up to 10 of these days for quarantining and can make a request for additional days. Uh, but of course, we have to have the proper documentation submitted to us to support that. Thank you very much, Jimmy, and thank you again to our team. Uh, Jimmy, you were first up, so uh, you've gotten some questions here out of the way, and uh, thank you so much for folks who've submitted their questions to us our, already. If you would like to review our reopening plan in great detail, we have our planning document, A New Way Forward, on our website right now. Uh, we also have a condensed version that you can see on our website. Just go to jefferson.kyschools.us and click on the JCPS reopening plan section. It's right there at the top. Tons of resources are available for you right there. More resources that we have for you new this time in our town hall. We're trying something a little bit different. Um, so we're, there have been so many questions that have come in and we see a pattern frequently asked questions that we get many times. So what we've done is we put many of the answers um, on the screen for you. So those answers will be scrolling throughout the program. Um, so this may help with some questions that, that you have. This may be one of your questions. So those answers are going to be scrolling throughout the program. But if you have another question and your answer isn't up there and you haven't heard it answered yet, that's okay. That's why our text lines are open for you this evening. If you have questions regarding our safety protocols when schools reopen, the phone number to call or phone number to text right Rather, our text line is 502-383-9894. So you can text in your questions. We've got lots of people standing by to answer those questions for you. You can also text this other phone number that we have here. If you have questions about in-person or virtual learning, the phone number to text there is 234-1460. So we have two options for you uh, to get the best information to you and try to get those questions answered for you as soon as possible. We will be answering questions that were submitted during our program. Uh, so I know lots of you have questions, so go ahead and get those questions in um, right now. And we're excited because we have some great people who are here with us, our participants who have uh, graciously agreed to be here this evening and to ask some questions of our district leaders. We are joined this evening by Tammy Berlin of the Jefferson County Teachers Association. Tammy, thanks for being here with us this evening. We are joined by Nicole Humphrey, who works at Hazelwood Elementary School. We love Hazelwood, so thanks for being here. We are also joined by Nichelle Harvell, who works with our great and awesome transportation team. We have the extraordinary Shauna Stinton, who is our site-based decision-making council coordinator. She works with all of the school's SBDMs. And we are also joined by Bobby Joe Kingery, who is here with the 15th District PTA. We have with us some other parents as well. Danielle Whiteside and Lachey Cooper are both here with us today, uh, parents of JCPS students. So I'm glad to see you. Met you guys a little bit earlier. Thanks for being here today. We are also joined by two students, Sliana Messvin, who is a student at Eastern High School. And we're joined by Luke Lush, who is a student at the Academy at Shawnee. We love it when students can be a part of this. I don't get to see students nearly as much as I want to, so I'm glad to see you here this evening. So we will go around and ask as many questions as we can during our program. And Soyana, uh, since we have some students here with us, we are going to begin with you. What's your first question this evening? Thank you so much. My first question is, what means of instructional and emotional support will be provided to and for marginalized students forced to balance learning with life handling the COVID-19 pandemic on top of other exasperated, sorry, exasperated disparities? And Dr. Coleman, I will pitch that question to you. Yeah, that's a great question. So one of the things that we will emphasize with, with our schools and that, um, and that we'll, we'll talk more about as we get closer to hopefully an in-person return is, is the fact that we really want time to be invested um, when students are back with us in person, even more than ever with just giving students time to, to to be together and, and um, talk with one another, to talk about the experiences that they've had um, through this last year. Um, and and we, we know that, um, that we really have to nurture um, those needs and, and find out about what our students have been through. We also have a wonderful team of mental health practitioners and counselors across the district. And we have very specific plans in place um, for addressing uh, meeting the needs of our students um, and families too when we return. 
All right, thank you, Dr. Colvin. I know, Sliana, I think you have another obligation. So I'm gonna go ahead and let you ask your second question now. Thank you so much. Um, my second question is, when it comes to the gradual shift of normalcy during this, um, during the process of reopening, is there a specific timeline regarding this shift? Um, if so, how will different grade level schools be evaluated? And Dr. Coleman, I will uh, hand that question to you as well. So um, in, our, in, in the plans that we are proposing, our youngest students would return first um, within a gradual um, return of, of our older students, middle and high school. Um, you know, and it's certainly we, we want to take that in phases. Um, and, and, you know, be sure that, that everyone is having a good, safe and sound start. And we have great plans and we, we are very confident that, that it will be very successful. Thank you, Dr. Coleman. Thank you, Soliana. I know your schedule is tight tonight, so we appreciate you being here with us this evening. All right, we do wanna to go to Tammy Berlin, who is with the Jefferson County Teachers Association uh, to ask her question. Good evening, Tammy. Good evening, Renee. Good evening, panel. Um, I, my members are interested a lot in air quality in the buildings. So could someone please explain what the district is doing to address airflow and air quality concerns as we prepare for a potential reopening? And I'd like to uh, put that in the context of, I heard you mention during Tuesday's school board meeting that classrooms in 13 buildings had already been checked for airflow issues. So will each of the other classrooms and workspaces in each of the other buildings be checked before a possible return to in-person schooling? Thank Thanks, you, Tammy. Tammy. Chris? I'm oh, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, Renee. Uh, yes, that's a great question. Um, so just to clarify, uh, th there were 13 schools identified that, that are on what we would consider like a closed loop ventilation system. So the, the system itself is not pulling in the outside air uh, much unlike the other schools throughout the district. So our first priority was to go to those schools, identify which rooms specifically uh, had no access to, to, to fresh air, for lack of a better way to explain it. Uh, there's two ways fresh air can be brought into the, to the school building. One is through dampers that, that bring in the outside air and, and funnel through the, the HVAC system. And the other is through open windows. And so our, our top priority was getting into those 13 buildings to see which classrooms, first of all, uh, had had open, had uh, operable windows, if you will, to, to, to bring in fresh air. The second piece of that was to look at which ones of those rooms, uh, whether it's classrooms or workspaces, um, had, had access to outside air through the ventilation system. And so there's a couple different ways. There's air handling units that bring in air from, from up top on the dampers. Uh, there's fan coil units and there are uh, univents that I think we're all familiar with. And so we went through uh, room to room, uh, each one of those 13 buildings and identified just a handful of what, what we think are classrooms. It's hard to tell because some of them have been uh, transitioned into um, you know, collaboration or conference rooms, but we think we, we have a pretty good handle on it. It's, it's about eight rooms, eight classrooms uh, that we're gonna have to provide some additional type of, of accommodation to or work with the principal to figure out a better plan of action. That's just those 13 buildings. The other buildings, um, our, our chillers and our boilers and, and water towers, are, they're inspected monthly, but the, the entire system uh, is inspected yearly to make sure that it's, it's being maintained adequately. And that's at every school building. Um, in addition to that, just being that, the, that there's a good likelihood we may return back to in-person instruction for elementary, we kind of put them at the front of the priority list. Uh, by the end of the week, we will have gone through every classroom in every elementary building to make sure that the, the HVAC system is working properly in each one of those rooms as well. And we'll address that as needed. Um, but again, those things are uh, inspected yearly. We are inspecting them again now uh, just to make sure that there are no issues with them. And on top of that, we have a digital control monitoring system. We can act, actually monitor those remotely um, from, from central office, if you will, from the HVAC uh, shop. Um, and that's in addition to uh, observation that's going on daily by operational staff. So we have a pretty good uh, and thorough and comprehensive and there, there's several fail safes uh, layered in that as well to make sure not just that our systems are operable, but they are functioning at capacity and providing that airflow that's needed. All right. 
Thank you, Tammy, and thank you, Chris. Uh, one of our parents is here with us this evening, Danielle Whiteside. Welcome, Danielle. Tell us your question. Hello, everyone. Um, one of my questions is, of those students who did not respond, do we know the demographics? And are those individuals participating in NTI right now, logging on daily to instruction? Um, if not, what confidence do we have that they may do face-to-face -face or the virtual instruction academy? Thank you, Danielle. And I will uh, start with uh, Dr. Coleman. And if uh, Chief Moore wants to jump in, and you are more than welcome. Yeah, that's a great question. And, and what's been really interesting about that is that it is pretty evenly distributed across demographics. Um, so we are not seeing um, a real pattern as far as any particular demographics, um, you know, not responding or, um, you know, responding a lot more. It's, it's, it's really very evenly distributed. We know that also participation rates now are pretty evenly distributed across demographics. So, so that's interesting. Um, as far as whether or not they, you know, what decision we will make, you know, they'll make those that we haven't heard from, um, you know, schools are reaching out, making every effort to get in touch with the, their families to find out, um, you know, what their choices will be. So um, I, I anticipate that we will continue to have a better and better idea of course, as we reach more families. But um, right now it's been really evenly distributed. And, and I know you um, mentioned our confidence level of those students returning. And we, we've been at 60-40 uh, probably since um, December, January, 60% uh, wanting to return, 40% uh, selecting the virtual learning with a 90% uh, return rate. So uh, we're, we're pretty co confident that that will remain uh, the, the number right around 60% of our students returning. Thank you very much. We have a few questions that we have received and uh, Chief Chevalier, we are going to direct these questions to you because these uh, pertain to students with special needs. So one of the questions we have is, will supports be given in the classroom of, or will students be taken out of the classroom, students um, who need additional support? Yes, thanks Renee. Um, principals are looking at the staff schedules and the student schedules and trying to reduce the travel time between students and related service personnel as much as possible. However, if students are required by their IEP to go in a regular ed classroom or to get services in a small group or individually, they will do that. Um, our students um, you know, require certain things per IDEA and their IEP and they will receive those with, you know, we, we have um, a, an abundance of PPE and specialized PPE for our staff. So, um, you know, with, with scheduling PPE and, and um, our kids being social distanced, it will, I'm very confident it will be fine. All right, one more question for you, Kim. We'll stay with you while we have you here. Another question we had is what additional supports are being given to teachers in ECE classrooms? Currently, um, we have been working with them for those specialized PPE. As you saw, if you looked at the, uh, watched the board meeting the other night, we showed uh, specifics, the clear shields, the covers for the shoes, et cetera. Those are um, readily available to whoever would like to use those. We have uh, continued our district guidance and our trainings. Uh, our implementation coaches meet with us uh, one to two times a week to talk about next steps and um, how to call parents for ARCs if, you know, behaviors, et cetera, um, you know, need to be addressed. And we have guidance on how to properly evaluate their progress on their IEPs and what they've been doing since they've been in NTI and what we can do for them when they get back. Thank you very much, Kim. Mm -hmm. We appreciate it. All right, one more question, then we'll go on to our participants. Dr. Polio, 
we've been giving you a little bit of a break tonight here. I'm going to call you back in. Kind of uh, nice. you, you thought you were off the I hook. Need a break. <laughs> I'm going to rope you back in. All right. One of the questions that came into our text line, Dr. Polio, is, is it possible that elementary or some grades could return to in-person and other grades not return to in-person? Uh, that is not in our planning at this point. Um, I think it's, it's pretty clear right now in our planning, although we haven't released exact dates, um, but that um, based upon the schedule, the vaccination schedule, we know that all of our elementary went by school um, in alphabetical order. So our school list, um, and we'll start back again tomorrow. Um, so therefore, based on vaccination schedule, all of our elementary um, pre-K through five um, we'll uh, be through the vaccination schedule at the same time. And we anticipate, as I said on Tuesday night, that third week of March is being a time when um, our elementary schools would be uh, able to do that. And then following that would be middle and high schools. Um, as we know, we have spring break the last week in March and the first few days in April. Uh, but right after that would be available for our middle and high schools to open. So uh, I guess the answer to that question would be no. Um, we would be basing our opening plan on level, though, not specific grades. There is a possibility that we will present, though, that we could have a one-day uh, ability for our brand new students to a school to be at that school a day early. So kindergarten, um, sixth graders, and ninth graders could have the opportunity for a day so that we could acclimate them to the building because those students have been virtual only uh, this year, and we want to give them one day to acclimate to that building. Okay. Dr. Polio, I don't know where the questions are going, so I can't guarantee you another break, but I'm, I'm hoping for it's you. All right. It's all right. <laughs> all right. Shauna Stetton is next, and uh, Shauna Stetton is a JCPS employee, and she has a question for leadership. Yes, thank you. Is it confirmed that we will have a district-wide transportation team in place to transport symptomatic students from school to their home in cases where the family has no transportation? Hi, Shauna. Yes, we will provide transportation to students who are exhibiting symptoms of being sick. They'll, they'll have to be transport, transported separately. Um, and so, but we, we will make sure that students are able to get home when, when a parent's not available. All right, thank you, Chris. Uh, Nicole Humphrey from Hazelwood. Good evening, Nicole. What's your question? Good evening. Um, my first, first question is, um, will there be licensed medical personnel on hand at each school location to provide critical medical evaluations for ill students and staff, um, including you know, checking students' temperatures and monitoring their sick rooms? Uh, Eva, I'm going to toss that one over to you. Sure. Um, thanks, Nicole. The, the, in response to that, yes, we are working with the agency, the staffing agency that we um, contract with to provide medical personnel for all of our buildings. And those medical personnel, in addition to that, will have nurse practitioners available all day, every day for schools. If there's an event that somebody's not right there, that they'll be available for telemedicine visits. But the intent is to have a medical provider for every building. Thank right. you. Thank you both. Uh, we have one of our parents with us, Lachey Cooper. Good evening, Lachey. What's your question? Good evening. Um, with the cleaning protocols that you have on your slide deck, who will be responsible for the deep facility cleanings? Deep facility cleanings will be taken care of by our housekeeping services, our custodial staff. Okay. Uh, all right. I will thank you very much for that. I will go to Bobby Joe Kingery with our PTA. Good evening, Bobby. Good evening. Thanks for having me. This is kind of a two part question. Um, what is the protocol? Um, if we require a negative test to return, or if we prevent someone from returning because of specific, or a specific, I can't say the word, specific, specific COVID tested, COVID test. What if they, if we send them home the next day and they, they appear at the bus stop? So we can't, the driver can't leave them there. So what is the protocol on that? Chris and Eva, if you guys want to jump in on that one. 
Sure. So if I understood the question correctly, if a student is at the bus stop, um, but exhibiting some type of symptoms and being sick, what happens to that child? And so that, that, that student will still be transported to school. They'll be seated in the front part of the bus near the driver um, and isolated from the rest of the students on the bus as best as possible. We, we can't leave a student at the bus stop. But I, I think, Bobby, too, what I heard you say, if that student was positive for COVID and when that happens, there'll be outreach from the contact tracers that will work with the families. The health department will also be involved in the case. And so part of that will be a, a protocol for self-isolation for people who are positive. So um, we'll be specific with parents in the understanding that they're not going to be able to return to school with a positive COVID test until that time period is passed. All right, thank you everyone. All right, we have one of our transportation team members here with us now, uh, Nichelle Harvell. Nichelle, what's your question? Good evening. Um, one of our questions is, if we have a full bus of students uh, and someone is sick, how are we gonna separate them from the other students? Well, we'll have to isolate them as best as possible towards the front of the bus. And that, that might mean that we've got to make some different seating arrangements on, on the, the rest of the bus for the other students. Um, we'll, we'll have to do the best we can based on the capacity of the bus and, and how many kids are on there. Eva, did you want to add anything? No, I was just going to say that there'll be space reserved at the front of the bus in situations where a student might be sick so that they can be isolated toward the front of the bus and away from the other students. And the way the buses will be loaded is they'll be loaded from back to the front. So those first seats that are set aside will be specifically um, so those students that might be sick don't have to walk by the others. Thank you, everyone. All right, Luke Lush is one of our students at the Academy at Shawnee. Luke, thank you for standing by. We're glad to have you with us. Love seeing students take part in events like these. Uh, so Luke, if you can go ahead and let us know what your question is. Okay, so a little bit of it, a little bit of my question has already been answered, but I just want to make it extremely clear for everyone who's maybe watching. So, what procedures will be put in place in the event of a student um, having COVID nineteen symptoms during school? And what I mean by this is, where will the student go, and will other students that may have been in close proximity be notified along with their parents or not? And uh, Eva, I'm going to let you on, you take that one. Luke, that is a good question, and that's a very important question. So there's a, a couple way the ways the processes will be in place. So first of all, if we find out that, that a student is positive for COVID, every school will have a healthy at school officer, and that's the person that parents will report positive cases to. And there's a process that they'll make sure that that's reported to health services, and then we'll have contact tracers that will work with the health department on that case. And so part of that work will be identifying anybody who might be a close contact to that student, and that's defined as anybody who would be within six feet for 15 minutes or longer. And so we are in the process of implementing a new uh, system in the district. It's a, actually an electronic health record that will help with some of this, but it'll have class rosters, um, the bus list will be in the in the system as well so that we can more quickly identify those people who might have been in close proximity and then we can work with those students to figure out who those cl close contacts might be. Hey Luke, wait till you see your new school when you get back. It's, it's an unbelievable. You've got a new library. You've got a new auditorium. The pool is fixed. Third floor is being worked on right now. It's going to be an awesome building. Can't wait for you to see it. I've heard really good things. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, it is a fantastic uh, renovation that's happening there at the Academy at Shawnee. And uh, I know when you walk in, Luke, you have a big smile on your face when you see the changes there. So thank you both. All right, so we're gonna go back around, but before we do, I just wanna ask one of the questions that's coming on our text line. Again, you can text your questions to us. Uh, we've been receiving several questions here this evening. Uh, there are the phone numbers where you can text your questions. If you have safety protocol questions, you can text 502-383-9894. And if you have questions regarding the in-person versus virtual learning experience, you can text 502-234-1460. 1460. We have a team of people standing by to interact with you during our program. We also have the answers to some of the questions that we get all the time uh, scrolling on the screen for you um, as a convenience. So we hope that we can answer your question here this evening. We do have this question that's coming on the text line and uh, 
Chief Robert Moore, I will pitch this one to you. Will students in virtual academy have the same assignments and projects as the students who are in person? If not, how will they switch back and forth? Yes, the, uh, the, the students for our virtual learning option uh, will have uh, similar assignments uh, and they will all be standards based. Uh, but uh, obviously on a virtual uh, platform, there are certain things you can't do as uh, compared to face-to-face, uh, -face. but all assignments will be uh, standards based. Uh, they will have access to grade level content uh, and the, uh, all, all instruction will be delivered by a qualified certified educator. All right. Thank you, Robert. We do have some more questions that we do want to just get to from our text line here. Um, Dr. Polio, I will pitch this question over to you. Uh, why is a hybrid schedule not an option for elementary students? Well, obviously we explored that and looked at it. First of all, looking at the numbers of um, students in school buildings in uh, elementary schools, we are seeing obviously much lower numbers. You can take a look uh, family, there is a link on our website to show how many students are at each school. Um, but we also know that elementary school students uh, with smaller schools, we can space better. Uh, we have to, uh, we need that uh, everyday instruction for our elementary school students. And then we also know uh, child care is very challenging for any of our employees um, who uh, might have an elementary student only in two days a week, but not the other three days a week. So our goal, without a doubt, uh, is to get to five days a week as soon as we possibly can and do it safely. Uh, but if we look at the numbers, we, we feel that we can do that at the elementary school level very safely. And then at the uh, middle and high with our larger school numbers be in hybrid uh, and have that number to socially distance properly. You're still on mute, Renee. Thank you. I was talking to our team here, so I put myself on mute for a second. Uh, thank you for that. So we do have this question, and I'm glad this question came up because Eva Stone and myself and my team, we were actually having this conversation just this afternoon. So it's, it says, will parents be regularly informed of any positive cases at their school? And if so, how will they receive text messages? Um, and so the answer is yes, we will keep parents meaningfully informed um, about if there are positive cases, if there is a need to quarantine. And uh, we are looking at the option to be able to text people um, specifically in certain classrooms. Um, and so we are working through that process right now, but we already have um, standard letters that are will be available uh, when our schools reopen. And we have a communication process and a system that is in place right now. And um, Eve, I don't know whether we were having that conversation just today, kind of updating our, our progress on that measure. Would you like to add anything else? No, you covered it very well. We are we're working out this system with the health department. And, you know, I think that's important for families to know that we've got a partner with our health department and that we want really solid systems in place to keep everybody informed. All right. Thank you, Eva. All right. So we've gone through the first round and I'm going to go back around through everyone to ask your questions to our district leadership team. Uh, Tammy Berlin, we will go back to you. Tammy is with our teachers association. Hi, um, could someone please explain in detail how contact tracing and COVID testing will play, take place in the event of a possible return to in-person learning? Eva, I see you already have your uh, sound off mute. You are ready. Yes, I'm ready. So, okay, Tammy, if we get, right now, we get reports, we have employees that are back to work. And, and so, um, you know, the governor has been talking, telling everybody in the state about making sure that parents report to schools when their student is positive for COVID. And so um, the same with staff members. So we've been reporting those numbers to the state already. Um, and so when we're back to in-person, that won't change. We have, we're still required to, re to notify the health department department of all reported cases. So when we are told that somebody has been positive for COVID, we will act immediately upon that. So we, we've got a system with the health department that we put into place that we can notify them when we've been notified of a case, they can verify cases for us. We're implementing um, this electronic health record called Frontline Health that will allow us to have health, um, to have class lists 
in the system so we can more readily reach out to people to let them know about positive cases. We'll have a process in place for employees and their daily health checks that will help us to monitor schools that might have symptoms of COVID. Um, there's a grant in place with the health department that um, allows for testing and we've started um, offering some testing. The health department has been offering some testing at, even at our learning hubs that has started um, for students or children who are attending those hubs. Um, we're making that available for our staff who, who agree, who volunteer or who are interested in being tested. That will be available for them. Um, and then of course we have our contact tracers that are working with our staff or students who are positive that will um, establish those dates when students can return. Those will be communicated to the Healthy at School officers um, and we'll be working with human resources as well in that. Thank you, Eva. Thank you, Tammy. Danielle Whiteside, one of our parents, is here with us again with her follow-up question. Um, my question is regarding to the CEP programs for um, children who need to be dropped off early and picked up late. I know the I've seen the dismissal plans and all of that, but I haven't seen how CEP would be incorporated and what adjustments will need to be made uh, for those accommodations. And I know, Chris, we were just talking about that as well. Do you want to jump in on that one? Well, what I could speak to is that CEP will resume normal operations before and after school uh, services for child care. And so they'll be expected to, to follow the same uh, guidance for safe schools um, that the rest of our schools will be um, regarding social distancing and cleaning and sanitizing and, and mask wearing. Um, I don't know if there's anything else somebody would add. I would add that they are partners. They've been partnering as well with uh, testing project through in conjunction with the health department. And so actually there'll be some of the sites where testing will be available for those parents and families of those kids who want to have screening testing done for their kids um, while they're participating in those programs. All right, thank you, Danielle, for your question. All right, we have a question in from the text line. I'm gonna to jump to that one real quick. Um, if a student gets a different teacher than the one they had in NTI, will the new teacher receive individual information about that student so that progress can continue? So I will uh, hand that question over to our Chief of Schools, Robert Moore, and to our Chief Academic Officer, Dr. Carmen Coleman. Uh, Chief Moore, do you want to go first? Yes, and uh, as you know, that student will still be a part of that school, so you'll still have a PLC collab uh, collaborative effort uh, between the teachers where that information is going to be shared, uh, social emotional uh, uh, information, uh, academic information, and all the critical information is going to take to make to allow that child to to be successful. And and I, and I will say, our, our our teachers, our principals, our assistant soups are doing everything they can to minimize. Uh, any p potential changes to a kid's uh, uh, teacher. Uh, they're, they're, they're working their tails off to make sure that the transition when we go back to school is as smooth as possible. They're working with Infinite Campus. They're being creative with scheduling. I mean, it's pretty remarkable uh, what, what, our staff is, what our staff is trying to do for our kids. And for those who are um, JCPS outsiders, uh, tell us what a PLC is, Robert. Professional learning community is a, a group of group of teachers who are working to look at student work, look at student data, to make critical decisions on how to Im improve outcomes for our kids. And Infinite Campus is the software that is used to uh, keep track of schedules and to keep up with student information. Okay, Dr. Coleman, did you want to add anything? Okay, all right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Shauna Stenton, we will go back to you for your next question. Okay, well, this is kind of a good transition from that one. If a student remains in NTI, what changes can they expect? For example, will they retain their same teacher and classroom expectations? Will they be viewing live instruction in real time from the in-person classroom? And Dr. Coleman, I will pitch that question over to you. Yeah, so good question. So if a student does choose to remain um, it, virtual, um, it is possible that their um, teacher will change. Um, as as um, Chief Moore said, we are trying our very best to minimize 
that, but it's very possible um, that the child will get a new teacher. Um, and no, we will not be um, doing any kind of, of, you know, live sessions from the classroom. So there, there, there will not be a case where um, students who are virtual, you know, would be in the same classroom, so to speak, with, um, with students who are in person. So that, that'll be a separate um, learning experience, but, um, but a good one, a good one. Thank you, Dr. Coleman. Thank you, Dr. Stetton for that question. All right, next up, we will have Nicole Humphrey, who is also here from our JCA ESP and is asking her next question to our district leaders. Nicole? I would like to know what the progress um, and the actions that the district has made in filling the hundreds of positions uh, that are still vacant for housekeeping, nutrition services, transportation, um, these are all crucial uh, positions that we need for our daily experience for our students and for our coworkers. So I'm just curious just to see where we're at in that process. Great question. That sounds Nicole. like an operations question for you. So that, that's a great question, Nicole. So we've actively been working on uh, ensuring appropriate timeliness of, of, of hiring and filling these vacancies. Uh, it's been somewhat of a challenge because we've been out of school, real school or in-person school, if you will, since for almost a year now. Uh, and so we, we've specifically speaking for like transportation, uh, we're working to fill about 153 vacancies. And so of that, we've got uh, 10 new hires that are in the training pipeline that'll be ready to roll out uh, when we return to school. We've got approximately 70 sub drivers and uh, open route drivers and then um, We've also are working to contract with uh, local vendors uh, to supplement uh, the driver's um, force. And we also reached out to about 240, I believe, retired drivers uh, to solicit their interest in coming back uh, to, help, to help fill in some of those vacancies. And one other option I think we've, we've taken advantage of before in small pockets is, is looking at uh, utilizing some of our activity bus drivers at schools to help with maybe some of the local runs at middle and high schools. Uh, with the custodians, we've already been uh, in contact and, and entering into a contract with a few vendors uh, to supplement that staff. Um, we also uh, have reached out to retired plant operators. Um, just they, they would be a, a quick, um, a quick hire uh, to fill in with a great skill set. Uh, and then we're also looking at some other um, local contractors too to, to supplement that workforce. With nutrition services, actually, it, it's we have um, more more applicants than we do positions to fill at this point. Our, our vacancies right now in, in nutrition services are, are really calculated on what normal operations would be if we were serving. Uh, lunches at school every day and, and nutrition services a little bit differently because it, it it is funded based on the number of meals we sell and right now we are not uh, distributing as many meals as we normally do when when we're in in-person instruction and so uh, to fill those now would actually be uh, kind of hindering our, our our revenue that we generate uh, through nutrition services so we, we've got eight liaisons working with nutrition services specifically that are actively hiring uh, those positions to fill them uh, when we return. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. We appreciate that answer. Uh, next up is one of our parents, Lachey Cooper. Lachey, you still with us? I am. Will, will parents have to self-certify their, their students and will the staff have to certify prior to entering the buildings? Can you explain what you mean by certify? Um, basically a questionnaire as to if you've been around anyone with COVID or exposed to it. Um, had a temperature, anything like that. Eva, I think you can uh, answer about uh, what parents will attest to before their child comes to school. Sure. So parents, um, you will all get information on the symptoms of COVID and then um, we'll be asked to, to basically um, agree to not send your kids to school if they're sick and um, staff. And then of course, students will have their temperature screening when they, when they arrive at school each day. Staff um, will be completing a health screening each day and um, will also um, be part of having the temperature checks done. And um, that's just a, a screening method, but um, especially with staff, it'll help us monitor for symptoms and be able to respond if, if we need to at any particular schools. 
Neva, I'll, I'll stay with you for a second because this is a question that we've gotten and we actually have this, I think, up on our screens here. One of the questions is, um, does a child have to uh, present a, a negative COVID test before they can begin school? Um, and the answer is no. The state guidelines don't call for that. And um, so, no, that's not a requirement for kids to start school. Testing is available for families. There's widespread testing available um, in the city. And so um, it's certainly something that parents could take advantage of, but it's not a requirement to return to school. Thank you, Eva. Thank you, Lachey. All right, Bobby Joe Kingery, who is with the PTA, is here with us. And uh, Bobby, what's your next question? So in regards to mental health, um, we all know that our young ones have been going through a lot, not with just COVID, but within our city. Um, how are we going to manage those who may have lost someone due to COVID um, when it comes to mental health? Because we all know that when our kids go back, they may have lost a student or a teacher or a staff member to COVID. And Dr. Coleman, I can let you talk about some of the uh, mental health supports that will be available. We have, having served in um, several school districts, I can tell you that I would put the the, the support that our schools and students um, and even adults receive um, for situations, losses such as what you describe. I mean, it is, it is second to none. And, and we certainly are very aware um, that there will be situations like this um, when we return and, and we are, our mental health um, practitioners already have plans um, in place and they will be ready to support those students. And in fact, have been doing that throughout, um, throughout NTI. So we, we aren't just waiting to, until we return to do that. We've, they have been um, working tirelessly to, to support our students, our staffs and their families. Our, our MHPs as we call them, our mental health practitioners, they are amazing. I was talking to one the other day, the story she was telling about the things that she's doing right now and the outreach that's been happening during distance learning. Um, I don't think people know all the things that go on. We've tried to tell that story. And we're gonna tell that story some more because it really is incredible, the connections that are being made and the work that's happening um, to help families in crisis and to, to help be there for mental health supports for our students and for their families as well. All right, we have this question that came into our text line. Um, and Dr. Polio, you still with us, Dr. Polio? I'm here. <laughs> All right, so this question came in through our text line. Does JCPS believe the safety guidelines can be followed and not greatly impact instructional time? So there is no doubt in-person instruction is going to be uh, influenced when we are uh, social distancing, um, checking temperatures, um, doing all the things that we need to do. And I think uh, the state guidelines recognize that there is going to have to be some time to do that. Um, but there is no doubt. First of all, I want to say this, Renee. Um, I said it the other night. I want to say it again because I do believe in our students. Um, I believe our students will step up. Um, and those that are choosing to come back will follow the guidelines, will mask, will do the right things. Um, and I believe that it, it, being in this district for 20 years, I've seen students step up um, in times, difficult times, crisis times, but the students are always the one that's those that step up. And I've seen that time and time again, and I believe that will happen again, um, where our students will step up and, and do the right thing and make sure they follow those safety guidelines. Uh, but, but I'm confident that um, we will be able to have meaningful instructional time for our students. Um, our staffs at schools have been planning so thoroughly um, that I know that, yes, the first few days, just like any school year, um, you know, when students are finding their first period class and their second period class, and now they're going to be coming into school, getting their temperature checked, and we're going to be doing lunch differently. So, you know, it, there was no doubt that we're going to have some a few days at each level when we do this. Um, of figuring things out, but I'm confident just like every school year that each school after a few days will get into a routine, our students will get into a routine and we will have meaningful instructional time for our students. All right, thank you, Dr. Polio. Uh, next up, Nichelle Harvell. Uh, Nichelle, do you have another question this evening? Yes, they would like to know um, how will we be able to social distance on the school bus? 
And Nichelle, you are a bus driver? Yes. So asking how bus drivers will be able to social distance on the bus. All right, yes. Chris Parkins, you want to take that one? I will. I think we need to be clear that, that social distancing is, has, has not been expected to be maintained on a bus um, based on our state guidance. Uh, they, they waived that requirement um, just based on the practicality of, of being able to transport all students to and from school uh, efficiently. So um, there, there, there is a potential that buses could be operating uh, at capacity. Thank you, Chris. And, and Renee, what? can I? Yeah, go ahead, Eva. I just, I just want to say, as, as in addition to that, that you know, that's part of the purpose of the other mitigating factors that'll be in place. So students will be wearing masks on the bus. Students will be using hand sanitizer when they get on the bus. Weather permitting, the windows will be down on the bus. Um, I hope every one of our bus drivers has been vaccinated um, as another means to protect. So there, there will be other mitigating factors to help offset what may not be in place as far as social distancing. Thank you, Nichelle, and thank you, Chris, and thank you, Eva. Uh, Luke, are you still with us? Yes, I'm here. Hi there. I know you said one of your questions uh, had already been answered, but do you have another question for us this evening? Yes, I do. Okay, go ahead. Uh, so my question is, and a little bit, of the, a little bit of this has already been answered as well. Will we be going back to school five days a week or in block learning, like two days at home and three days at school? And if it if it's separate in blocks, um, which days of the week would we be going to school? Sure. I'll let Dr. Polio take that question. Yeah, Luke, happy to answer that. So right now the hybrid plan is that we would be have two groups, A and a B group. So the A group would be A through K, the B group would be L through Z. So clearly you would be in the B group student. So the A group students would go to school on Monday and Tuesday. Uh, that would be their in-person instruction Monday and Tuesday. So each high school, as you know, and middle school schedules a little bit different based on the site-based decision-making council. Uh, some may be on seven days, some may be on block. So each school will manage that schedule, but the A group will go on Monday and Tuesday. All students will be asynchronous on Wednesday when we will deep clean the schools. And then Thursday and Friday would be the B group. So you would be um, outside of school with the L being the last name, Monday through Wednesday, you'd be in-person school Thursday and Friday. And Dr. Polio, it may have been um, answered before, but just to remind everyone, so the elementary schools for the proposal for right now would go five days a week and middle and high uh, would be in the hybrid model that you just described. So why would middle and high be in that hybrid model? Well, when we look at, at the size of our high schools and middle schools, I mean, when, when we look at several of our high schools are 2000 students, um, you know, and there is a varying size and many of our middle schools are 11, 12, 1300 students. So when we look at social distancing and on average, 60% of the students are on person, in person, we can do the math on that. So 60% of a school uh, that has a thousand students would be 600. You know, if there's 2000 students in the school, which we have several of our high school, that's 1200. Um, and then so being on an AB block gets us to divide that in half. Um, and be anywhere between five and 600 students. So when you're looking at middle schools and high schools, which are much larger buildings, five and 600 gives us the opportunity uh, to spread out and have that social distance. Once again, Renee, um, you know, we, can, we will continue to monitor. So uh, as we get to that proposal, we'll continue to monitor the data. And, and hopefully as data goes down, as it's continued to do over the past several weeks, you can see those charts on our website. I believe today's count was at 21.1 cases per 100,000. As they continue to drop, we could obviously make a change with that. Um, and we will wanna be five days in middle and high as quickly as we possibly can, whether that's in April or May or whether that's in August. I'm gonna go ahead and jump in and use this opportunity to remind our families that may be joining us here um, and maybe have not already filled out their selection form and their preference for how to continue learning when our school buildings do reopen. Uh, please go ahead and fill that out. Uh, you can just go to jefferson.kyschools.us and you can uh, click on the select in-person or virtual learning. It's really easy to complete. Uh, we have almost all of our families who have completed that. We still have a few families that haven't. So if you have not completed uh, that selection form to let us know how you'd like to continue learning when our buildings open, go ahead and do that. 
I wanted to have an opportunity. So I thought I'd go ahead and take it to make that plug and encourage families to do that. All right, so we have a few more minutes and I wanna go ahead and get through one more round. I'll call this our rapid round of questions here. Um, so we'll go back through everyone. And so we'll see if we can get through and answer your questions as quickly as possible. Okay, Tammy Berlin, do you have one more question? All right, what can we do to alleviate the necessity for so many of our West End students to have long bus rides to and from school in the event that we've returned to in-person learning? So Dr. Poli, that's something that you would like to uh, talk about? Um, well, as you know, our current student assignment plan, um, uh, and, and I will, um, you know, put in a plug for what I believe, and Tammy obviously has been on our student assignment committee for several years, um, that, you know, we would obviously love to give those students that choice right now um, to go close to home. Obviously, we're going to have to build some schools in West Louisville, one of them being a middle school, and so um, our student assignment plan, uh, we are, you know, it is what it is right now, so to speak. I'm not a big fan of that term, but that's where we are right now. Um, and so, you know, ensuring that, um, you know, we provide those great opportunities on the other side of that bus. We ensure social distancing. Um, we make sure we have masks ready for students at all time, hand sanitizer. Um, we do that, but without a doubt, Tammy, I would say that um, our proposal for student assignment and building new schools in West Louisville would assist us um, in the mitigation process by having these brand new schools and having the option for families to be close to home. Thank you very much. Dr. Polio, while we have you, I'm gonna ask you one more question that's come in on our text line, something that has been brought up before in meetings. Um, with such a short period of time left at the, with the end of the school year, um, so what benefit what benefit is it for JCPS students to uh, go back in person um, this late into the school year? So I've been asked that a good amount of time with six or seven weeks. Um, you know, is that um, worth it to come back to in-person school? And so, you know, I'll, I'll state my opinion on this, Renee. Um, and so there can be differing opinions on this. So I want to be clear on that. Um, but I believe every day is valuable for instruction, uh, without a doubt. And especially when we are talking weeks of instruction, we know that some children, they've, they've thrived in NTI. We have found some children who don't thrive in the traditional setting are actually doing better. But so many of our kids obviously want to be back in in-person school. There's the social aspect of it, the celebration aspect of it, the relationship with teacher aspect of it. We are proposing um, that with our future state in the next uh, summers coming up when we're able to do this, that we will pay millions of dollars to give students four weeks of additional learning. That's how valuable learning time is for our students, four weeks, paying millions of dollars to pay teachers um, to, to bring students in and have engaging learning time inside of the school. So I can't say how much I believe the value of in-person instruction would be for six or seven or eight weeks, depending on the level how important it will be to have face-to-face -face contact with our students, to reestablish that we are back in school, to provide the mental health services that our kids need, the celebrations that our kids need, you know, and provide some sense of normalcy for those families that want to send their kids back to school. So, so six weeks of seven weeks, eight weeks, whatever that number is, um, you know, I value, and, and I think you could ask any teacher um, that has worked for me as a principal, They've heard me say often bell to bell instruction because every minute of instruction with a teacher uh, is so important. Every opportunity that we have with a child face to face is a chance to change their life. And so six weeks is pretty darn important to me, I'm going to tell you. And, and I think um, it is critical that we give that opportunity to kids as soon as it is safe to do that. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Polio. And so one of the things that we have seen on our text line too, people asking questions about individual um, school plans and uh, Robert Warren, I'm gonna bring you into this um, and reminding families where they can see those individual school plans and what may vary from school to school. The guidelines are pretty much the same across the board, right, Robert? Yes, we're following all the state state guidelines and we can, you can find those plans on our, on our website and on school websites. Uh, but our uh, assistant suits and our principals are combing through every detail 
of those plans to make sure that we return to school as safely as possible. And that's our number one goal. And you, you heard Dr. Polio talking about that, our laser-like focus until now, until we open those school doors. That's our, that's our focus, to open the school doors and open the school doors safely from uh, bell to bell, from when they get on the bus, uh, following the gu guidelines, when they get off the bus to walk into our schools, breakfast, lunch, classroom, common areas, getting on the bus, going home, opening and closing uh, the day safely as possible. Thank you very much. All right, Danielle, are you still with us? Do you have one more question? Yes, I have one more question. Um, and this relates to um, the board. Um, has anyone considered or thought that a medical professional should be at each meeting to provide a better understanding of the epidemiology of COVID-19 and to explain how the CDC came up with the guidelines. So, you know, as the board is meeting, they're asking a lot of questions, but someone to really explain, this is how COVID-19 works. This is how it spreads. And then once the board has that information, someone to explain it to parents, maybe on a elementary level of, this is the virus. This is why the CDC does this, because I think a lot of questions are coming from the lack of knowledge. That's a great point. And Dr. Polio, I'll, I'll toss that over to you. Yeah, thanks, Ms. Whiteside. And, um, you know, obviously such a challenging time for school districts and really for every for everyone during COVID-19. I say this all the time in every school district across America. No employee, no teacher, no principal, no superintendent, no bus drivers have ever had um, to figure out how we do school during a pandemic. Uh, the last major one being 1918. Um, and let's hope that we don't have to face it ever again. This is a one-time thing. You know, let's hope that's the case. So there is no doubt there are questions and all, all of our board members, uh, I know this, are committed to the safety and health of our students and committed to, to the learning of our students and our staff. Um, I know all seven of them and they are truly committed to that. Uh, but they obviously want to have all the information and all the questions. So we have brought in twice um, the, the Metro uh, Louisville Director um, for Health uh, and Safety. Um, she has come and as well as uh, the State Direct, the Assistant State Director. Uh, so Connie White has been with us and Sarah Moyer has been with us multiple times. But I have to say I'm very proud, I get that question, of a young lady who is on this um, call with us right now, Eva Stone, who I consider to be the best medical professional um, of any educator in this state. I know that of anywhere else. And she has been on every single meeting with us. Um, you know, I know when she had this job a year ago, she never thought she would be leading our district through this pandemic. Uh, but we're very proud of her and the work that she does uh, guiding our board members through this. And she does a great job. So thank you, Eva, for all your work. Thanks, Dr. Polio. Thank you, Danielle, for your question. Yeah, I don't know if Eva has slept or left uh, central office in the past year. So thank you for all your work, Eva. All right, Shauna, do you have one more question? I do. What role does the plant operator play in the collaborative reopening committee? That's a great question, Dr. Stenton. Uh, our plant operators are vital to, to getting our buildings ready uh, for reopening and, and play a crucial role in the collaboration with the administrative team at the school. They, however, will not be involved in the, in the CRC uh, as that'll be consisting of 50% of the administration and 50% of the uh, JCTA representation and then uh, another member from the, from the AFSCME um, yeah. union agreement. So um, th their participation will be, will be uh, significantly important and they will need to be a part of those conversations with the administrative team as those plans are being communicated out to the staff in the buildings. And I'll say, Renee, that the purpose of the CRC is to give all staff members a voice. Um, and so that committee will be the committee that if a staff at, at a school has questions about the individual school plan or wants to give feedback, those are those members that they go to. And I know in the next week or so, there will be collaborative presentations um, of the school's individual plan with the entire faculty of the school. Some schools have already done that. Some are in the process of doing that. And giving feedback to that team is so critical. So I think this is a great way for uh, whether that's the plan operator, a custodian, nutrition service worker, a teacher, classified staff, or administrator, this is a great way to get feedback um, at the school level. All right, thank you, everyone. Uh, Nicole Humphrey, do you have one more question for us? Uh, yes, please. 
Accountability by the district is of the utmost importance. How will the district ensure that the CDC guidelines are being strictly enforced by the stakeholders, including administrators, students, staff, and parents? And how will that information and expectations of shareholders so that they know these expectations and know what is expected of them by each individual role group? Dr. Polio, you want to take that one? Yeah, thank you, Ms. Humphrey. Great question. Um, what do you do at Hazelwood? I'm the school secretary. Oh, yeah. I love Hazelwood. Hazelwood's a great school. Um, and so um, thank you for that question. First and foremost, we want to have clear expectations around guidelines um, with students. I'm going to say this again. Students are going to step up. I know they are. I have confidence in our student um, and what they will do. So I get questions all the time about students not wearing masks. I believe, yes, we will have exceptions, but our students will step up and wear masks um, and do the right thing. You know, we, and we will say this, I said this on Tuesday night, we cannot always ensure 100% that kids will be six feet apart, but our schools will do a great job of ensuring uh, that we social distance as much as absolutely possible, whether that's in the classroom or the cafeteria. We're going to be uh, sending out guidance to our families um, around uh, mask wearing and the expectations of students and obviously staff in this. Um, we know with our staff and student, our staff especially, starting that we expect them to be role models um, and, and make sure that they demonstrate for the students the proper way to wear masks, the proper way to social distance, um, you know, and all the things that are necessary in the CDC guidelines. Um, and so we're going to be, uh, that, that's going to be very important for us. As far as students with things like masks, there is no doubt. Um, first and foremost, we don't want it to be punitive on the front end. So a student who has their mask around their chin or forgets to put it on, obviously we wanna redirect and tell our students, please make sure your mask is on. I mean, that's, that's layer number one, let's redirect, let's teach especially our youngest students and help them through this so they do it the right way. But one of the things we know that, um, you know, we're gonna have to be strong with and we will, this district will be strong and from a district perspective, we will support our schools. Um, if, a st if there is a, ref a fuse refusal, whether that be student or staff to wear a mask, um, we will make sure that that, that student, um, you know, especially will have to, to go to the virtual academy because we have to have students in the school that are following the guidelines and willing to put on a mask. All right, thank you, Dr. Polio. Well, Shay, one of our parents is still with us here. Do you have one more question tonight? Yes, um, two part question. Have the teachers been surveyed as far as who wants to return back to in-person? And if they have, what is the percentage of teachers not wanting to return to in-person? And I can say, uh, Lachey, we have not done a, a survey at this time of, of our employees. And Dr. Polio, if you'd like to um, add anything else to that. Well, I think, um, you know, what we've seen, the JCTA survey that was recently re released reflected some of the same concerns that we had um, in the fall um, around those teachers that um, had concerns about returning. I think in collaboration with JCTA, what we found was um, that teachers wanted more input, wanted more information and more communication um, about those plans. That's how we developed these CRCs. Um, so we are confident that as schools roll out these plans, as we give mechanisms for feedback, when we do things like town halls, like we're doing right now, the confidence will grow in our plans. Um, you know, we are very confident um, and I wish everyone, and this is what we are trying to do to kind of see behind the curtain of the work that we have done to prepare for this and how um, sound our plans are. I will put them up against any other district in the work that we have done, um, as we always do to prepare uh, to support our kids in the best way. So I think that we will see that only grow um, in, with positivity in the weeks to come. Thank you, Dr. Polio. Thank you, Lachey. Bobby Joe Kingery is still with us. Do you have one more question? I do, and this one actually comes from a parent. So they wanna know with the hybrid schedule, is JCPS concerned about sending middle and high school students back for only a total of 14 days of in-person for the rest of the school year if we go back mid-March? Would that be more stress on kids to go back for only 14 days? Dr. Polly, I'll let you go in. Yeah, so once again, once again, the, the other days will still be student attendance days, meaning they are learning. 
Uh, they are doing work. Uh, but I think, uh, Ms. Kingery, that's a decision that each family, you know, will need to make. So what we want to do is be very clear about what it will look like. So we have to know, first of all, and I've said this before, school will not be exactly the same as it was students returning as it was last March 11th um, in 2020. Social distancing, um, temperature checks, all of those things, cafeteria and how we eat, it's not gonna be exactly the same. Obviously, we're not gonna have large assemblies at school, pep rallies, those type of things. So we wanna be clear with families. You know, this is the, um, the option that we can do safely and effectively based on state guidelines at this time and the number of kids in our schools. Um, but then I think it becomes a parent choice at that point. The parents need to talk to their children um, and make that decision. Do you want two days of in-person and three days of, of that work at home every single week? Or do you want five days of the virtual academy? And so providing all of those options for our families is our goal. It is not ideal without a doubt, Ms. Kingery, there is no doubt. The ideal scenario is all students five days a week. We will work to that without a doubt when we can do that safely and the data says we can do that. Uh, but once again, I think that us painting that picture of exactly what that's gonna be and having each family decide with their child what option they would like to have. All right, thank you both. Uh, Nichelle Harville, do you have one more question? No, ma'am, my other question was already answered. All right, well, thanks for being here with us and uh, we thank you for joining us during our virtual town hall. All right, Luke, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Luke, do you have one more question for us? Yes, I have one more. <clears throat> okay, so when we return to school, will there be any sort of school hour uh, change temporarily? <laughs> Sorry, I made it sound like it kept going, but it, it doesn't. <laughs> That's okay. So you're asking if the, uh, the, the school day is going to change or the time right. school will change. Dr. Polio, do you want to jump yeah. in on that one? All right, what program are you in at, Sha at the Academy at Shawnee, Luke? I'm in the AIM Academy. Tell me about the AIM Academy. So in the AIM Academy, what I do is aeronautics. And that, that's my, like my um, job profession at the school. And that's what I'm training to do. I'm trying to get my pilot's license, pilot awesome. certificate, sorry. When do you think you'll get your pilot's license? Do I think I'll get it? When, when do you think you can get that? Well, the issue is we can do all the training however we can't go and do actual flight hours until we're back in school which is one of the reasons why we want to go back so bad um so it really depends on when we get back to school Does do you that support going back luke what is it so you support returning to school yes okay great great so um thanks luke i just like to uh, hear Academy of Shawnee is a part of one of our great academies of Louisville School. Um, and in the years to come, we're only going to build up the Academy at Shawnee. And, and our goal is to make that the number one academies of Louisville School. So probably when, um, you know, you have uh, graduated and are flying the skies, you can come back and visit and see uh, all the great things that are happening there. So one of the things uh, we want to minimize change as much as possible, Luke. Um, with our students in the final um, portion of the year, this final quarter of the year. We know the change is gonna be immense for our students, whether they're in the hybrid, whether they're staying virtual. So we're trying to minimize that change while still providing opportunities um, to make sure that we can, can do everything safely and follow those state guidelines. So one of the things um, you know we're looking at right now, well, I will say this, my passion is that our students in middle and high school are starting too early. Um, you know, we are starting school at 740. Many students, um, I don't know, when do you wake up in the morning, Luke, when, when you're going to school? I wake up at 6. 6 a.m. Uh, I'm so very that. much uh, wake up at 6, get dressed, go back to bed for 20 minutes, and go and catch the bus. <laughs> Sounds like you got the routine down. But you know, I worry that's not enough uh, rest for you, Luke, and, and the research is behind that. So as a district, we need to change that. I said that last year, right before we went into the, to the pandemic, um, we need to change start time for our middle and high school students. There's a lot of challenge with that because of the amount of bus routes we have. But as I said on Tuesday night, we are looking at staggering the start times. 
um, so that um, we can reduce our bus lines, but we can also begin to look at and use this opportunity to say, how can we have Luke not only get 20 minutes more of sleep after he's gotten dressed, but let's let him sleep an extra hour and a half and then get up and go to school. Now, obviously that means you're not getting out at 220. Um, so we will have many of our students going the same, but we are exploring that staggering option um, so that we can meet the needs of all of our kids. And then hopefully long-term, what we are doing is exploring. Um, and once again, you may not be the beneficiary of this, uh, but we are exploring that way so that our secondary students, middle and high school students can start getting those additional hours of sleep that we need so much that really are a part of mental health. The research is really clear on that. And so we're, we're looking to take a stand on that. And uh, this is a great time to, to, to do that. All right. Thank you, Luke. And thank you, Dr. Polio. And thank you to all of our participants who are here with us on the Zoom and everyone who was uh, watching from home. What I really loved about tonight, it felt like a conversation, it felt like we were able to just talk and answer questions and hopefully be as informative to you out there watching as possible. The great thing too, is that this uh, information will be on our YouTube page. So while it's happening live right now, it will be available to families on demand. So if you're watching it and you say, hey, I wish my friend could see this because she had this question, you can just send her the link right from our YouTube page and she can watch it at her convenience. So this will be available to you. It will be on uh, our JCPS YouTube page for you for a while. And we wanna say thank you to everyone who was watching. We had about close to 4,000 people who were on with us online watching. And we received between 1,800 and 2,000 text message questions to us tonight. Um, so we are thankful for everyone who has been involved and participated. Thank you to our JCPS district leadership team who has uh, been answering questions. I don't think you ever stop answering questions. Um, so thank you very much. And I want to give a special shout out to, to my team, the best team. Thank you guys for rolling with us. I don't even know how many virtual events we've done at this point, but you guys are the best. So Dr. Polio, I'll turn it back over to you. Yeah, thank you, Renee. And I've got to thank you. We've got a communications team second to none who uh, puts on great events like these, um, you know, and doing the best we can, obviously, to get information out to 4,000 people that are watching and be able to have a two-way communication where we're taking questions. Thank you to all of the uh, panelists, so to speak, that came and asked questions. We appreciate you being here live um, and asking your thoughtful questions. Luke, I appreciate you being here. I don't get to talk to students as much as I used to and love to. So I'm glad to talk to you. Can't wait to come see you at your graduation um, and see you back in school. And then thanks, obviously, to all of the administrators here, here at JCPS uh, who have. I mean, we, we've spent hours and hours and hours working on this, building this plan, um, and we're ready to go. We are ready to do this. And so students, we can't wait to see you. Families, we can't wait to see you back. Um, when that approval happens, we will be ready to go. Um, but we'll continue to work hard until that date comes and look forward to seeing you back in our schools. Thanks, Renee, and everybody have a great night.